little bit of uh, you know behind the scenes here. This is an activity, or this is based on an activity that you've adopted into your show, Adventures Through the Mind. Feel free to plug it. Uh, do you want to? You said you might want to kind of explain what it is and why you use it, and then we'll kind of facilitate it. Does that that make sense? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what you're speaking to is, um, and I feel embarrassed. I don't remember the name of the person. Maybe someone can pull it up. Um, but uh, a conversational structure called the Conversation Cafe, which uh, sort of operates as a way of holding a larger group into a single discussion that ranges, it'll explore and it'll sort of expand, but it always uh, rests onto a central question that guides the conversation. And there's a collection of different sort of uh, agreements that are read for people like speak from speak from the heart. Another one is like, go, go for depth, but don't go on and on. Um, and my experiences of doing conversation cafes is that it seems as though it allows something about the structure allows for groups to go in very deep um, in a way that feels really meaningful on a topic um, without feeling um, uh, without feeling constrained. Even though there's a structure, it's not a constraining structure. It's a kind of liberating structure. So um, what I what I did for the podcast is I felt like it would be really interesting to create or like uh, utilize this kind of conversational structure in a podcast situation where I could then share those conversations out and have the topics be relevant to the uh, relevant to my show, which is usually something with respect to psychedelics and the guests for the conversation, the participants to be selectively curated um, around that question. And so I started a micro series inside of my podcast called the psychedelic cafe. Um, and the hopes is that it sort of not only creates an exploration of content that wouldn't otherwise be, you know, seen or like um, wouldn't otherwise be available elsewhere because there's something about the unique meeting of individuals that there's a kind of mind that emerges in the conversation between and amongst the uh, the participants that cannot be prepared for and can never be repeated because it is so context specific but also beyond the content level a kind of a conversation that on the process level is quite different than most of what you'll experience um, in the podcasting sphere which hopefully itself could be used as a sort of modular structure uh, for people to then carry off into their lives um, because I didn't invent this conversation cafe and the instructions to make one or do one with your friends and family are uh, readily available on the internet. So that was a bit of a ramble. Did that all make sense? Is there anything else that you, you all feel like I may have left out? No, uh, I think uh, uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I think that's very cool. That's uh, This is the first time I've heard of this. So this is, uh, you, you would be the expert. And I think, yeah, I think you did a great job explaining. So you're trying to improve the quality of conversations and also create an environment and structure that does so. Yes. Yeah, something like that. I mean, <clears throat> quality of conversation is a, um, it's an, uh, th what denotes a qual the, a quality conversation? Is it quality simply from a neutral sort of uh, assessment of, of what it was like, or is it quality in accordance to a certain sort of marker that would suggest that it is of higher or lesser quality? And then what would that marker be? Like one of those markers could be a depth of a depth of meaningfulness, a sense of meaningfulness that's present for the participants, or a sense of accessing a kind of space in the conversation where something emerges that that seems like important and meaningful that was sort of contributed to by all parties um if that would be the marker then i my experience is that the conversation cafes can bring quite a high quality conversation um, or at least the, the structure yeah cool all right should we dive right in yeah, so I had kind of pitched this earlier, Nicole. Are you are you comfortable kind of like being the facilitator based on that uh, that's that simplified structure as written in the chat there? 
Um, I think so. Yeah. So, um, would you like me when you say facilitate? Would you like me to like moderate and like make sure well, maybe we can sticking to you, or should we just? There's only four of us, so we could probably just because I had expressed like I don't want to facilitate. I just want to participate, but it feels mm -hmm. like it puts you in an awkward situation, having never even sort of uh you know been, <laughs> never even rubbed up against the thing uh, to then try to like hand it off or something. Um, but the the why don't we try this so that it's not we're doing what like tw 20 minutes in this in this yeah or even uh like at most we we ran a little long on the opening bit so okay so what we could do is just there's a central question i think kelly that you made you can pose mm -hmm. the central question and what we could do is we could start by going around first and each person on the first round will just share one clear coherent thought on that question speak as though you're answering the question with the with the sort of preface of what is on my heart and mind with respect to this question so speak from personal experience speak with sincerity and a single thought is not this and this and this and this and this that's the idea of like go for depth but don't go on and on so try to hold it to a single thought as it goes around you don't have to respond to each other's thoughts um, it can be your own. It doesn't have to feel related to what the other person just said. Um, the second round is an open, dis well, I think we'll just do the three rounds like the Psychedelic Cafe. I think that was Kelly. That's what you're saying would work. Um, yeah, the second round would be an open discussion um, where anyone can speak at any time um, and respond to things or do total non sequiturs or say something it feels like nobody else is saying but feels like it's in the room. And then the third round is everyone shares one clear, coherent, concluding thought based on what came from them in the, in the conversation, but with respect to what the central guiding uh, inquiry or question was. Okay. Yeah, so should I throw out the question as I kind of had drafted it? Sure. Mm -hmm. So the question that I thought would be an interesting one to answer is, what does Christmas mean to you personally? Like whether, like what's your relationship is with it? What's your kind of general opinion on it? I don't know. I guess I just keep it open-ended. Okay. Did you want to start? Uh, no? Yeah, it's kind of whoever's ready to go is first, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of assumed that would be you since you drafted the question, but that might be presumptuous of me. Uh, I'll leave it open if anybody has a, wants to jump in with their, their one thought, kind of like a minute, I think, is the idea. But I also can jump in. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely been on my mind. I saw, you know, uh, a few people on some online communities I'm on talking about, like, having bad Christmases and growing up and whether they wanted to, like, reclaim it or not. And... Yeah, I guess the main thought I'm thinking right now is that the way it's kind of exists in the zeitgeist is really one dimensional and structured. Like this specifically is what Christmas is. It has like these songs and these decorations and these traditions. And for the kind of for the the game we're going to do today, uh, I ended up doing a pretty deep dive research into the history of like Christmas and Christmas figures and Christmas celebrations. And it's never been one thing. It's changed so much that we're just looking at like a, a window, a very brief snapshot of what it is right now, but it has always changed. It will continue to change. And yeah, I guess that's sort of my thesis statement is that like, I, I would like to see people like look at it more outside the box because the general idea of having like a winter solstice celebration is ancient and you don't have to do it the prescribed way you can do it however you want yeah is that is that pretty concise so personally i would say christmas kind of has like a strangely dichotomous feel uh in that my personal experience has always been quite positive uh it's basically just time to spend with my uh, close family my parents my sisters and occasionally extended family that i do not see very often uh the context is always a little strange because you're like 
sometimes listening to Christmas songs, et cetera. And it, there seems to be a generational gap as well, where uh, a lot of the times what me and my sisters want to do is basically just like watch movies and hang out and like eat food. And then some of the more traditional takes on the holiday are they're, they're almost like uh, vestigial and just hanging on out of uh, like repetition's sake. It's kind of interesting to observe. And then the flip flip side, I would say, is like the consumerist aspect of it, which feels sometimes abrasive or like it degrades the holiday or puts strange pressures on you to uh, like financially express your value of other people, which is bizarre. And that's that's how I feel about Christmas, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I guess. So my, uh, I also have a bit of a two sided view of Christmas. So, um, I know when I was younger, I had a very, um, I had a hard time with Christmas. It, uh, when my parents split up, it was like a really rough time of the year for me. Cause I was always, it was kind of awkward trying to navigate, their separate lives and their like um desire to be spending time with me um and try to make that a fun happy family time um so for a long years i was long while i was trying to convince my family to like boycott christmas or like change it trying to convince mostly my brother to like get on board with me on it um and then i met um the man that i ended up marrying me marrying um who had a bit more of a a less complex um, relationship with Christmas. He really enjoys Christmas music. He enjoys spending time with his family. It sounds like he has um, more of that, what you were talking about, Adam, that spending time with the family, eating food, watching movies, hanging out, um, having a really good time with his, with his family. Um, and so he is teaching me to love Christmas again. <laughs> um, so I'm getting a little less grinchy every year. Um, yeah, it's it's really nice. Uh, so, on on at risk of adding more than one thought, uh, mm -hmm. growing up, Christmas was a big ordeal in my house, and it's because my father was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, my parents were together, still are together. My father was a Jehovah's Witness, and my mother was a Pentecostal. And so, I don't know if you know much about Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's like it's very sterile. Um, like no holidays, uh, like you're not supposed to celebrate holidays and so on and so forth. So my dad was just very against these things, no holidays, no birthdays, etc. He was against them, but my mom was for them. And the sort of balance of divide there was, okay, so she could do whatever he wants, but he's just not going to participate in making it happen. And mind you, when Christmas actually came, he was very excited to get whatever gift he was getting and participated, but pretended like, he was still being a good <laughs> Jehovah's Witness by not having whatever. But I think my mom, she took that as like, okay, well, I'm going hardcore. And for many years, she would deck our house out during Christmas. Like we were walking into Santa's village or something like, um, like w walking into a, cr a Christmas village. Like she even had like a really beautiful like Christmas village miniature that she'd set up and like the whole house would be decorated. And um, yeah, so nowadays that's really softened a lot as my, my father left the church and that sort of those pressures aren't really there anymore. And um, it has kind of become this thing that's mostly for the kids, my nephews and our family has sort of shrunk down. We had a lot of extended family growing up and, People are living elsewhere with different lives and different families and et cetera. And so it's kind of gotten into this very small thing that is like mostly just for the kids, my mom and my dad and my sister and the kids. And, um, and that's great. That's really nice. I also struggle with that consumerism thing that's been spoken to a couple of times, especially when there's so much like hoopla about gift giving for the kids, which I feel really uncomfortable with, but it, they're not my kids. <laughs> I don't get to make that decision. Um, and uh, I mean, it's not it's not super excessive, but to me, I'm like anything more than one gift feels like too many gifts or something. Or maybe I'm just being a grinchy. Um, 
But nonetheless, this year I'm excited because my partner's family is going to be coming for Christmas Eve with my family. And that'll be like the first time that I've had that happen. So that feels exciting. Um, Oh, a third thought, which is that because our family unit has been small for the last few years, we've sort of like reached out to any friends that we have that don't have family to be on Christmas to come be at our Christmas Eves. So we've sort of like adopted like uh, Peter Pan lost children on Christmas Eve for the last several years. My mom (laughs) and dad have been really awesome with uh, welcoming my friends in so that they didn't have to be alone on Christmas Eve. Uh, Yeah, so... That was a little ramble, more than one thought. End of the first round, I guess. Sweet. So yeah, now we kind of just have like an open forum about what we just talked about. Well, now we're kind of break out into open discussion and anything anyone can say anything about whatever is alive for them with respect to that question or what others have said or not said. Although the encouragement is not to speak directly to each other but to speak into the circle as is everything spoken is to the entire group. And so there's never any crosstalk, even if one person is talking to specifically to something else that somebody else said. Okay. I, yeah, I had a thought that uh, actually came up when you guys were talking about the consumerism aspect of it, um, which I really, yeah, I, I agree. That's, that's part of the problem that I have with Christmas and part of the problem that, one of the reasons that I was cheering for us to boycott it. Um, But I, so I read a, or listened to the audiobook of Hillbilly Elegy, it's called. Um, And it's basically a a book about um, a guy who grows up uh, quite poor in the States somewhere. I don't remember exactly where. Um, And there was a point that I really connected with where he was talking about Christmas and how his family for Christmas And the kind of the thing that you would do for Christmas is everyone, everyone he knew was dirt poor, but everyone's families would basically at Christmas go out and spend beyond their means to spoil their children, to make their children feel like they weren't poor and like they were getting something, getting, I guess, yeah, getting the the best Christmas that they possibly could. And they would spend beyond their means and they would um, go into debt doing this. And then they would spend like the next like four to six months trying to pay off this debt. Um, And then they would do the same thing again next year. Um, And I remember, so I I was, yeah, not very well off when I was younger. Um, I, yeah, I remember there being lots of financial issues when I was a kid. And I specifically remember my getting very lavish electronic gifts for Christmas and all these like big cool things. And it's like, it really struck me that that was why that was why my parents were doing that. And that why that was, or that that was something that was not like isolated to my family is that it's, you know, this overcompensation, this feeling that in order for our kids to have a good Christmas, we need to buy them these things and we need to spoil them and they need to have this and they need to have that. We don't want them to, you know, feel like less than when they go to school and talk about their gifts. And um, yeah, I think it really feeds into that consumerism culture, even for people that can't afford it. Um, and it sucks. I think there is something more to that as well. Uh, and I think there's something beautiful in like wanting to give your children gifts and like provide them a certain quality of life and all that kind of stuff, make them feel loved. But also like if you do it purely through gift giving, there are other ways to show that you value your children. If you do it like primarily through gift giving and like put a lot of emphasis on that, it does like teach them certain ways of showing affection in addition to it like teaches them to seek n- new and like fancier objects all the time as like a form of uh i don't know Im- improving their own personal quality of life right now uh in that it doesn't really like work super well as an adult uh and that stuff is like super ephemeral and like it like makes you feel good for a moment and then you forget about it like hedonic adaptation is real uh, I don't think it sets a great precedent for like how to be frugal or even humble uh, to your children, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, I think it's come up a lot in our discussion here, but it definitely is one of the main themes that comes up, just how people discuss 
Christmas in general is you get the words of like the consumerism or just like the financial strain. And it's interesting how that, that way that gift giving and like is set up in this really specific and constrained way. Like everyone buys gifts for everyone. And you know, there, that doesn't like correlate with maybe how able you are and you know, you probably can't help but feel like a little bit different when you get something that's really, uh, I want to say nice, but I guess like specifically financially valuable or not. And it, you know, brings me back to the history stuff again, because I have been reading about it, but the, like the origins come from kind of two places. There's some origins of gift giving in, you know, pre-Christian pagan stuff and uh, but a big part of why we give gifts at Christmas comes from the 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 acts and deeds that were ostensibly performed by Saint Nicholas, like before he got amalgamated into the Father Christmas character and into these you know Santa Clausy characters. Uh, the actual saint, or you know, as historical as these stories and uh, like biblical scriptures are, but the main kind of gist of that sort of gift giving and that was actually a big part of the early christian church was giving specifically to the poor and the needy so in in its origins the point was if you had means this was a day if any to go out and give to people who were in need and it's it's interesting how that gets turned around so backwards when it's now the people who are in need are being put under more financial strain or more strain of their means rather than less, which was arguably the original intention. And yeah, it just sort of like circles back to that main thought I have of like the way specifically that we do it doesn't have to be the way we do it for all the reasons we've been talking about, but also like very specifically, it was done in different ways before. And I think there's a lot to be learned from those ways. Hmm what Kelly was just speaking to and uh, what has been brought up a handful of times about like shifting away from things that as I've gotten older, I've noticed like, Oh, this doesn't really work for me when I was a kid getting lavish with gifts and like knowing that like after all the gifts were given the big gift would came. I love that shit. I was about it as an adult. I'm like, ah, uh, as much as I still liked those gifts, I don't think it makes sense. And starting to wonder about realistically what does make sense to have as Christmas traditions if, yeah, now that we're all adults. And one of those things that does not make sense is everybody everybody buying everybody else a gift. Right off the bat, it's because I'm a, you know, I'm in the sort of peak income generating years of my life. I don't need anything as a gift, like I will appreciate gifts if they're sentimental, but I don't need my parents who are living on retirement to be buying me things that I wouldn't just buy myself. Right. And I also recognize there's a lot of fun and play and positivity that can come in a kind of gift giving. And so one of the things that our family has done is we've shifted over to doing like um, a secret Santa thing where everybody is given this is the amount. It's a very reasonable amount. It's about $30. Buy something that is somewhat gender neutral or could go either way. And then we do like a game where there's like a secret Santa. And nobody knows what it is. And you can like steal the gift. And so it's like becomes play, but it can only be stolen so many times. And it's like it creates a sort of like fun opportunity to sort of lean in. Um, and that being a part of it being a part of also gathering together on these days because I mean, Christmas isn't too long after the darkest day of the year, which is still dark days for at least a month, you know, a month and a half before it starts to lighten up a bit again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had a similar experience with my family where... Um, slightly different it's not even that like my parents are on retirement my parents are like the most affluent members of our family like we're all you know i think comfortable enough in our own ways but my parents are just like they're they're super affluent and suburban so they have the means to just keep buying people gifts and it had to kind of be uh me and my one brother in particular kind of pushed back to like nobody in this family really wants for more stuff at this point 
So can we scale down buying everyone everything into, we've turned into sort of a gift exchange where like there's four pods, there's my parents, there's my brother and sister-in-law, there's my other brother and his girlfriend, and there's me and me. And uh, it's uh, like, so you give to one of the other pods. Like I think the first time we did a draw for like a rotation, I think because we actually did it as like, you know, five, six, seven individuals. Um, but we've simpled it down into four pods and you just know who you're buying for this year because it rotates and like, that's fine by me, but it's still stuff I don't need. Cause like, I don't really need anything. And there's stuff that, uh, especially me and the same brother have kind of also worked in there. Like, Hey, let's make the theme this year, like stuff you can consume. So like bottles of wine, baking, anything that is like kind of a part of the normal flow of your life anyway. Um, or experiences we've done stuff like that like i've done that for uh my other brother has three kids and they they get like a lot of stuff as is kind of like you know we did growing up and i'm like i I, i'm not gonna just go buy those kids more toys they have enough and they they don't feel like uh oh hey you know like certain uncles aren't buying us more toys so i usually kind of try to go out of my way to like i think one time i like uh like one thing they actually like is getting little like certificates it's like a coupon for a nature walk like cost zero dollars but the kids feel like you're spending time with them specifically and they love that and like if you don't continually reinforce the idea that christmas is about like the toys and physical presents like kids are smart like they can be attuned to the idea that a gift can be time spent or that a gift can be something else so yeah, there's 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 that too. Yeah, experience gifts have been huge. Like my partner and I, whenever we get gifts for the nephews now, it's like we lean towards experience, um, experience gifts. They're like nine and under, they're not watching this. So for example, instead of getting them gifts this year, what we decided to do was collectively, it's also my sister's birthday shortly afterwards, that we would take us all to the to the Ripley's aquarium in Toronto, which is this massive aquarium i got some issues with aquariums ethically but like as an experience for the kids to have um it's like yeah this is this is great other times we've got them classes of different varieties and stuff because yeah also like watching kids open gifts like this is not just specific to my family but having been to different birthday parties and stuff this whole premise of like not letting the kids slow down to be interested in the thing that that you just got that yeah yeah they got another gift you got to open the next gift and open the next gift it's like sure they'll find one of those gifts that they really appreciate um but like that means everything else is just kind of thrown through the window and it's just background noise rather than letting them get excited excited or disappointed about one specific specific thing and like i think i'm trailing off a little bit so i'm gonna stop talking um, I guess I had one more uh, thing to say about giving gifts for kids is my brother and sister-in-law have done a very, I think, cool thing because they they have everything they need for their kid. And my my parents spoil the crap out of that kiddo. Um, and so something that they've done, because he's also not even two yet. Um, so for him, he doesn't, again, like you said, like they're just you know, if he's opening gift after gift, he doesn't have time to appreciate them. And like, he might not even pick up that gift again. Um, So what my brother and sister-in-law have done is said, Hey, if you want to contribute a gift to um, our kiddo, we've set up a fund for his college. We're starting that already. If you want to do something monetary, if that's like what your deal is, you like, you can contribute to that. And that's like something that's contributing to his future. But like, he's two, he's not going to remember every gift that he opens now. Um, but he might appreciate that. And it's a very practical thing for him for the future. So, yeah. Doesn't feel as fun, maybe, as giving a, a <laughs> gift, but like, it's much more practical. <laughs> if I was young, you're like, don't worry, little nephew or niece. I got you a gift for your uh, for your future college. I'm like, oh, I wanted <laughs> Pokemon cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Kids love. Co- oh, sorry. No, I'm not going to say that. It's a joke. Okay. No jokes and sincerity are. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna say lot. something, I think. Play is sincere. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um I I do feel like we could go with this for hours, but I wonder if we should do our little like closing round here so we can actually play our scheduled game. 
Yeah. That works for everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So, so the third round is just similar to the first. We'll just each do one like quick closing thought. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. I guess. Oh, well, well, I just got put up on screen. I guess I'll go. Yeah. Um, (laughs) yeah. So my closing thought is that, um, I believe it is the case that humans likely gathered in ceremonial or ritual ways around this time of year, at least those living up in the North and for good reason. And that is a long standing history and that, uh, it doesn't always make sense to throw out all history when we get into the new and fandangled. And although what this time of year has become presently as a consequence of the sort of like the whole, like the hold that the, capitalist consumer market has on the minds and behaviors of its uh its um its uh person's domain and what like the the sort of grossness that christmas has become from that material standpoint that not to like throw the baby out with the bath water and like lose the opportunity like lose the recognition that this is actually a very special important time of year in the sort of arc of seasons in the northern hemisphere um and to at the very least as as kelly was pointing to try to find things that are meaningful um and ceremonial to to me me trying to find that feels like an important act that I'm making and it's not to replace christmas it's to find myself in this time of year with others in ways that hold me and them in it in meaningful ways. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that. That's, um, I guess, kind of the conclusion I'm coming to as well with the um, what I was saying about learning to love Christmas again is learning to love it in a new way that is free of guilt and um, obligation for gift giving um, and more feels more natural and intuitive and more focused on, um, you know, family quality time and all those things that we're actually going to remember and that the kids are actually going to remember. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of have similar thoughts along the same lines. I think people don't have enough community in your life, in their life, If you can build that with your family, that is a a really good place to do that. Christmas can totally be that. That is a large aspect of it and probably the most positive aspect of it is just spending time with people that you have history with, that you care about, and that you like. Uh, Yeah, those relationships are invaluable. You, You should not take them for granted. Even with the bad parts, I think it is still worth it. And if you can improve upon the bad parts, it will be even more worth it. I don't think I can say anything that hasn't been said already, but yeah, I think the kind of way I would summarize it is that um, as with so many things, like nothing, especially something that's kind of maybe fraught or complicated, needs to be exactly the way it is so you can strip it down to like well what is the essential like what is the what is the kernel of like the thing that i is valuable in this and you can rebuild outward from there and there's a lot you can draw from to do that Mm -hmm. i'm hopeful that our generation is going to be like leading the charge on that just talking to you for i'm like okay cool so other people have these same ideas um and i'm hopeful that we can like cast off all that bullshit Hmm. yeah cool wow that was fun to be sincere i I want to i want to point out just like from an experience standpoint like we kind of like just jumped in that did a little eh, for what 25 minutes or something um and you probably had the sense of like whoa this could actually go very deep you know, like if you if we look at how deep we went in only a short amount of time on a singular question, um, the opportunity to go even deeper remains with the right amount of time frame. So if if, for example, 
a cafe, if anyone is going to go from here to try it out at home, you know, setting something close to like a 90 minute mark and it's contained. It's not like it just goes on and on. Everyone knows it's 90 minutes and somebody's tracking the time. At what point do we stop the discussion round to have closing thoughts? It's incredible how deep and focused it can go. And I think we all just got a little taste of that literally just on the surface of what was possible in that conversation with just that single question. Right, that one question just unfolds. Um, so, yeah, that was great. I appreciate you, uh, y'all, bringing that in for sincerity. Hour.